everybody really excited about this program today. So we're going to keep things going. I'm going to just introduce Joe in a minute, but Wendell asked me to give you a little my thoughts and for whatever they're worth. I want to piggyback on what Charlie said this morning. I just went to a three-day seminar two weeks ago. It was called Colorado Counties Incorporated. All 64 counties are represented there. We are by far one of the top counties in this state. We are progressive, we're growing, we have a sales tax. I talk to counties and they go, what do you mean you have a sales tax increase? How can that happen? Ours goes down it. Our property taxes do not cover what it takes for the counties to run and do the services in their counties that the people expect. So I just kind of back off and listen to them. I don't brag about Chaffey County because we are so good. We are so ahead of the spectrum of the majority of the counties by far in Colorado. And so, yes, there's no question. We have a labor force challenge. Really addresses that in education. We have a housing challenge. But that's why I asked Eagle County, they figured they, they're taking care of maybe 15% of their workforce so they can live in Eagle County. Breckenridge, and I don't know, John, you know countywide what it is, and Breckenridge, you say, are about 50%. I'm not sure that it's that, I am, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure it's that high countywide. No, it's not. But I don't know the number. And I checked with Corey, and he said Chaffey County is about 60%. So there's always more we can do. There's no question about that. But I want to applaud some of the private sector entities in Chaffey County. Tom, John, Paige, I don't know, I lost you someplace, I'm sorry. Paige, these private sector builders are building for the market and below market needs of Chaffey County. When those are available, then that automatically frees up some other units that the lower or working class, 80 to 120, 80 to 100% AMI can move into. So with the private sector, and Dan said there's a project coming, hopefully in a month or so, that we're gonna, gonna know about. Uh, how exciting is that? John's getting ready to, I think, pretty soon break ground on 16 apartments on Oak Street. Is that my, pretty close on that, John? So things are happening here. Let's, let's carry this positive attitude forward that we have been so fortunate to have since about 2011, we never took a big dive, we took a dip. And, and I've been here 30 plus years, and I've watched this ebb and flow, and that's what it is, it's an ebb and flow. It's not a peaks and valleys for J.P. County. And that's what's so neat about living here. There's no question about it. So we've got this positive attitude, we've got some challenges that we have to address. It's neat that Lendl and Reed, sorry Reed, I lost you too, um, Reed, brought forth, which has been going on, I talked to Greg Felt before he left. We faced this in the rafting industry when we started our businesses back in the late 80s and early 90s. So it's, it's more apparent today than it was back then. So we've been working on all those things. And, and I just want to, let's not get our dollars down and oh, that we're, we're so far below this, we can't correct it. We can because we've got great pri private contractors and a lot of citizens uh, willing to work and donate their time to make JP County even better than it is today, just like we have since I've been here in 1986. And with that being said, my privilege to introduce a financial guru. <laughs> I'm not going to read his whole bio because it goes on forever, but Joe Rowan is the Executive Director of Funding Partners, which is a non-profit community financing development institute. 
And I don't know why or who put this in there, but at the end of his bio when it says, above all, he maintains a wicked sense of humor. So that's good. That's, that, that's just, that's what we want. That just carries our positive attitude out a little bit further and we can see a little humor in all this that we're going through. So that, Joe, thank you. All right, well, I hope I don't disappoint uh, any of you with uh, my financial guru-ness. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get to uh, have a little bit of fun. But, um, and just to get a sense, and I apologize, I wasn't here at the very beginning of your uh, session this morning. So maybe just to get a sense of who all's in the room, what you're, where you're coming from on this. Is there anybody, in the, or is there anybody in the room that feels that there is a lack of uh, quality, decent housing inventory within your community? <laughs> Excellent, I'm in the right place. Um, is availability of housing integral to uh, integral component in an economic development? Yep. Anybody feels it? Okay, all right. And uh, how many people feel that uh, housing is, the housing needs of the community are best served by the public sector? How many how many people think the private sector is best suited to address the need? How many people think nonprofits? Anybody think the combination of all those? Uh, all right, all right. We're on a good, we're on a good, uh, good path. So let me just give you a quick introduction to what a CDFI is, uh, Community Development Financial Institution. Basically, what that is, um, we are kind of like banks, but we're not. Uh, in fact, uh, we work with banks very significantly, and our charge really is to deliver capital and credit to folks that are not receiving adequate attention from the mainstream financial services industry. And specifically, we target low and moderate income families and those that serve them. And so one of the unique aspects to what we do is that, uh, you know, banks are taught, are told uh, by the regulator under the Community Reinvestment Act that you must make loans to poor people. Sounds good, except they got another set of regulators that come in and say, what the hell are you doing loaning money to poor people? This is risky stuff. So this community development financial institution uh, industry was created to help bridge that gap. So basically what banks do is they invest in us. And then we turn around and we make the kinds of loans that, again, try to target, in our case, we target uh, housing, the housing industry. So we provide both retail financing, so that's down payment assistance, energy efficiency lending, uh, uh, rehab to folks that own a home. We also uh, provide financing to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not staying where I'm supposed to. Well, <laughs> so you're not. Yeah, 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 this is going to be recurring to you. Uh, <laughs> but we also provide financing to, uh, to developers, private developers, nonprofits, housing authorities, and, and folks that are trying to create, preserve, or rehabilitate housing that targets low and moderate income families. Now, when we say low moderate income, uh, you know, the traditional sense is, is that it's 80% of median income. And, I, and I'm sure all of you know what that means. Maybe you came in, but you've seen fancy charts, so now you know it all. Um, so I won't go into explaining all that, but clearly what we have in Colorado is we've got three different markets. We've got the Eastern Plains and the Southern tier of the state that, you know, again, they, their, their issue is, is that they're losing population. They've got housing, but the housing inventory just isn't very, uh, it, it isn't well kept, let's just say that. Then you've got the frangers, the people that come and steal your water, uh, and, and we've got all the folks over there. And we've got urbanization going gangbusters. So we've got a different set of issues. But up here, and everything west, uh, and I would throw Boulder in there, because they need to be somewhere, uh, you've got uh, really, 80% of median income, you can't serve those folks. Uh, you, can't, you can't provide ownership opportunity for folks that are at 80%. So we actually have expanded our definition to include really uh, up to 160, 200% of median income with folks that we will serve with our, uh, with our, well, with our technical uh, services because we have to provide technical assistance. Uh, that's a charge that we have. And then as well, provide finance. And so we do it in a number of ways, and I'll get to some of that as we go along. But before I get too far into this, I thought it was important to maybe uh, put some pictures, because I'm not very good at this, so I'm proud of myself for doing this. 
uh, some pictures of what we mean by affordable housing. There we go. So here's what affordable housing is. Um, there you can't see this very well. But you know, it's nice airy. Uh, you've got uh, various materials and so forth. Uh, you know, it's full. You know, it's, it's um, we also have workforce housing, which of course, you know, this is for people that work. Affordable housing is for people that can't afford it. This is for people that work, so you know, they, they, they need a chaise lounge out back. So that's important that we have that. And then of course we have housing that happens to be affordable for people that work. And this particular example is, uh, is, is in Delta. So this is a project that we worked with the Delta Housing Authority. Where they uh, created a, a project using the tax credit program. So uh, Urban Inc. is an example of what you're doing here. But I want to maybe just bring these pictures up to, to point out one thing, and that is the terms affordable and workforce and all that, they don't mean anything. Because frankly, all housing should be affordable, right? If it's not affordable to somebody, we got a problem. So the challenge really is, is how do we create uh, housing that is affordable to folks that, are, that, that span the economic spectrum? So we need housing that is uh, made available, it's, it's decent, safe, decent, for folks that really have no income, all the way up to you know, the, the county managers, the county uh, commissioners, you know, all the people that are really at the top of the game, right? Because I think the county commissioners uh, actually are pinnacle, right? I've seen your salaries, so uh, you guys, you guys really are the, the ones that we have to target with some of that high-end stuff. Uh, but it, it is important that we have that we do, we do consider that everybody, uh, you know, needs to be served in order for it to be called affordable. Um, now, I'm going to stop here for a second because a lot of times when I come out. Uh, you know, out, outside of the, the urban areas. Uh, one thing that I hear is, you know what? There wasn't anybody around helping me try to buy my house when I moved here. And so, you know, maybe it's just a matter of folks need to buy their time a little bit, save, work hard, save, do what I did, so they can afford to buy a house. Well, one thing I'll point out is that a house that was built 30 years ago probably was built under much different zoning regime. It was built to different standards. Uh, it was the the uh, business or the building codes continue to uh, escalate, you know, what has to go into a home. And there are market factors that drive up the cost of housing. And so I, I thought I'd throw this, this one up here. Uh, if you can, hopefully you can read it. But this is from the Census Bureau, so this may be reiterating some of what you've already heard. But back in 90, uh, the median household income in Colorado was about 50,000. And the uh, median home value was about 105. And I bought a home in Fort Collins at about that time frame, and it was 104. So you know, I, I think there's some validity to that number. But if you jump over to 2015, uh, 2015 incomes went up about 10%, or excuse me, about 20% uh, over that 25-year period. But look at the home values. And again, this is statewide, 239, so this doesn't even reflect what's going on here. But the home value, more than double. So in 1990, uh, it was about, uh, home was about two, and two times your uh, annual income, household income. Today, it's over four. And I would say that in uh, Shaky County, it's probably significantly higher than that. And of course, uh, we can see that from statistics. But I, I, I want to bring that up because it is important to recognize that it isn't just a matter of, you know, providing a hand up to those that, that, that uh, in, in debate whether or not it's a hand up or a hand out. But the, the, the reality is, is that it is more expensive to own and own today uh, to, to purchase. So it, it is something that we have to deal with. But and I, I'll put a few of your, a uh, few of you maybe uh, have some concerns in the back of your mind. Here we go. Here's another uh, bleeding heart liberal coming from the big city to tell us what we need to do. We need to raise taxes. We need to create more government programs. Uh, you know, we need to jigger the system a little bit. But here's a dirty little secret. I actually believe that less government tends to be better government. And when you look at the industry that I work in, 
you might say, <laughs> right. And I do. And here's why. Because I actually believe that human capital is a, a critical component to economic development. And uh, unfortunately, we've developed a need for shelter as humans. Uh, so we need, we need to address that. I also believe that a vibrant, resilient economic environment um, really calls for, um, you know, or, or allows us, I should say, to uh, achieve other shared objectives of the community. So if the community at large wants growth, great. What are you willing to give up in, in, uh, in return? If you want, uh, you know, to, again, to do other things with, uh, with public dollars, fantastic. What are you willing to give up? Um, but I will say that there's never a bad time to, to, uh, to make a good investment. And I honestly believe that housing is an excellent investment, not only in the community, but in the people that make up the community. But more important, this is above all else. I'm in this industry because I really like causing trouble. <laughs> I, I mean, I really get off on this. And anybody who knows my background, you know that this isn't something I've come to late. Um, I actually uh, I think that it, it creates some agility in our industry if there's, if there's one person, at least in the room, that says, ah, I don't think so. And so I usually volunteer for that job. Um, but it does keep us agile. Uh, but in, in, in that vein, I'm gonna, let's uh, maybe start boring some oxen here. So one thing that uh, is, a, is a tremendous impediment to efficient markets, I think that term has come up before uh, uh, earlier, uh, but we, all, we talk about, you know, we need uh, efficient markets can actually address the housing market. But there are impediments to the efficient market. And one of those impediments is the expectations. So we use the term affordable, workforce, and what have you. But I think what we need to do is think in terms of basic. So basic housing. Start from that and then build. So I think that uh, one thing that we trap ourselves into is thinking that Safe and decent housing needs to be a place that we all would be proud to call home. And we're applying our standards to what other people's needs are when we do that. And so it's okay if quote unquote low income or basic housing looks different than other housing. It's okay because we're actually feeding into the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, misconceptions, if you will, if we say that, no, if it's going to be low income, it really needs to look like every other house that's out there. We can't allow people to look at this project and say, that's where the poor people live. Because what you're doing is you're just feeding into people's fears. You know? So we have to come to terms with that. Uh, I think that durable, quality construction, it, it can be achieved without architectural flourishes. Basic housing. Because the more things we add on to that home, and whether it's a home or an apartment building or what have you, the more things you add on to it, the more it's going to cost. And the more it costs, the more subsidy that's going to have to come from somewhere. And subsidy is something we're quickly running out of. We're running out of the sources. Another thing that we also uh, actually require, or in most cases when we're using public sources, is we want to use the most cutting edge technology when we build these homes. We want them to be green. In fact, I'll tell you, I've been in a couple of public meetings now where I've actually heard the public demand that if we're gonna invest public dollars into this apartment building, it needs to actually reduce carbon footprint. In other words, it needs to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. I've heard that twice. I mean, that's the kind of expectations that I think we're kind of feeding into when we talk about how do we uh, get people, uh, or bring people into the mainstream, make them feel like part of the community, and so we're creating these artificial constructs that say that we need to spend more to make a home more affordable. And to me, that doesn't make any sense. Um, I think that, again, that anything beyond basic requires a, a subsidy, and another perverse aspect of this is when you create housing that, again, we all would be proud to call home, you're removing incentive from people to move up and down. Because if you if you have two homes sitting next to each other, one is quote unquote market rate, the other one is subsidized, they look exactly the same, they all got the same features, they both got uh, stainless steel appliances, they've got a community room with workout center, blah, 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 blah. Well, what's their incentive? They're a move out of the house. 
because they can't afford the one next door, but they've got all the same amenities. And so we create this kind of this perverse uh, structure that kind of holds people where they're at. So we, you know, you create basic housing, and again, now they want they want those other amenities. Well, great. You're going to have to take those steps. You're going to have to you know get your financial house in order, so to speak. In the meantime, you've got a safe, decent place to live. It just doesn't have all the bells and whistles. So again, just some things to, to, to keep in mind. And, and I'll, I'll stop here in just a second. I know that Wendell, when I talked to him on the phone, he said, you know, if you could, could just provoke a few uh, thoughts, you know, people's minds, that'll help us kind of get started in the afternoon. So bear in mind, I'm really doing what Wendell told me, okay? <laughs> so let me just make sure that everyone's clear about that. Uh, all right, so in the, in the housing study that you had, uh, EPS provided uh, some information that showed that uh, you know, and, and, and again, I'll quote out of here, for sale housing can be delivered at 80 to 120% of AMI if land costs can be controlled. Fees and permits have an impact on home prices, estimated at approximately 10%. And so here's the chart that you know, shows what, what goes into the, the housing cost in each of the three communities that were cited. Okay? And up at the top, you can't read it, but uh, Buena Vista was five, and Slide of Punch Springs, they're both about 7% for fees and permits. Here's what they left out. Fees and permits are only part of the cost that, that are imposed by government regulation. We've got uh, <coughs> zoning, which plays a big part. Uh, you've got uh, the entitlement process, uh, building code, design standards, carrying costs for the, uh, for the developer. Those all add up to the cost of housing. And so the uh, Home Builders, National Home Builders Association, they did a, uh, a study in 2011, they updated it again in 2016, and what they tried to do is identify what goes into the cost of the home relative to, uh, again, government uh, regulation. And it's often cited that you know, land is land. And it's a, simply a matter of supply and demand. They're not making any more of it. Well, you know, some parts of the world, the, the stuff is coming up, but um, they're not making much more of it. And the supply, or excuse me, the demand keeps going up, so that's what's driving the cost of land, but not really. So what, what the Home Builders Association tried to do is, is to tabulate, based on some surveys that they had done, again, this is on a national level, so some of this may not necessarily translate to local, but it gives you an illustration that there are other factors. So in the, co in the, the cost of the improved lot, you've got just the delay, and that's the process where you know, the developer and the, the developers in the room probably can corroborate some of this. That, you know, you, you've got to figure out what the rules are, you've got to interpret the rules, and then you've got to go uh, defend your interpretation of the rules and before you can really get moving on your project. Then you've got uh, the, the zoning, the subdivision process, you've got uh, uh, the costs that, that come up after you've got your approval. So now you've got to get the site ready and you've got to, again, start to uh, build all those uh, elements that are necessary in your project that were, uh, that were a result of your uh, approval. And then you've got uh, dedicated land. So uh, again, I don't know how much of this is really applies in, in the various communities, but typically you've got setbacks, you've got uh, land dedication for parks and schools and other things. So that's land that you can't build on. So that gets buried into your total cost. And then you've got the development standards. Now, again, they're looking at what, what uh, uh, changes have occurred over the last 10 years. So what are those doing to the cost of, your, of just the lot? And so you can see that the median will range from about 30% up to 70%. Median is about 50% of the cost of the land. So it's not just a matter of supply and demand. It's what you can do with that land that's just driving a lot of cost. And then, of course, what they translate that to what that means in the final purchase price of the home. So it's about 14%. Uh, but then you've got another set of regs that come in once you start construction. So now you've got your permit. This is where the permits come in. So you've got the permit, the impact fees, et cetera, and the 5.3 is about, again, consistent with what your study shows. And then you've got, again, changes in building code standards. And that's, you know, another uh, roughly 9%. I'll just point out though that if you look at um, what that means to the final purchase price, at, at just about 
you can start to see now where developers, the builders of these homes are actually, their margins are squeezing over time because there's only so much the market can pay. But they're incurring more costs up front. And I don't bring this up just to, to vilify government because I'll, I'll, I'll skewer everybody here. But uh, just putting this in numbers, and, and this is actually based on a, a $334,000 or $800 uh, uh, median home price nationally. Uh, that they looked at, it was actually, they adjusted it uh, for inflation between 2011 and 2016, just so you could get an apples to apples comparison. Their, their estimated is about 65 grand was in the cost of that home. By 2016, it jumps up to uh, about 85, just under 85,000. And so when you think about it in those terms, it's no wonder it's hard to build affordable housing. And this one's going to be really hard for you to read, but just to put it again in perspective, uh, the regulatory cost, what they're estimating, is about 30%, has gone up 30% over that five-year period. Consumer price index has only gone up six, and personal disposable income's only gone up over 14%. So now you start to see where some of that accelerating divergence, and, and Reed's uh, uh, chart that he showed, you know, how home prices doing this and income's doing this, this starts to illustrate what is, is behind some of that, uh, that ex exponential increase. And by the way, Reed, uh, thanks for the heads up on the 2029 uh, recession, because that's, uh, I'll, I'll be putting some bets on the market. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe just, uh, just leave this up for just a second. I, I, again, I don't want to just skewer government, because I think that, that everybody plays a role in this. And I'm going to, again, uh, if you'll not get too wrapped up around the axle, around these generalizations that I'm about to make, I, I want you to know that I'm culpable because I'm, I'm a member of all three of these groups. But, you know, as a business owner, I want low taxes. I want a simple, predictable interface with government. I want a qualified, abundant workforce. I oppose social engineering. Uh, I look for that straight thumb that's sitting on the scale. The bottom line is I'm taking huge risk with my capital. And so, I want to be rewarded based upon the merits of my own skill and execution. However, I also want more customers. I want the register to ring you around. I want to contain costs so I can deliver greater value and, and uh, greater value in the competition. Taken together, what that does is it pushes up the value of real estate because you're generating more revenue from that piece of dirt that you operate out of while you're holding your wages in check. So the private sector has some culpability in the, in the dilemma that we have here. And as a leader of a nonprofit, I want people to embrace the importance of my mission. I want a stable, predictable funding source. Uh, I want to change the culture so that the progress towards eliminating the problem becomes a shared ethos. And the bottom line is I want to action with clear, demonstrable, and positive impacts. However, just because I operate on a shoestring budget doesn't necessarily mean I'm more cost-effective or efficient than, uh, than a public or private sector solution. Uh, I also believe constituents deserve the right to live with the same level of dignity that everybody else. And together, these objectives seek, tend to seek equal outcomes rather than equal opportunity, which again kind of goes back to the point about uh, free enterprise. You know, so uh, yeah, you're right. You, you follow the dollar, but what we want to make sure of is that uh, again we're not trying to change the, the, uh, the construct of, uh, of our system in the process. We want to address certain problems, but not the, the larger, uh, I guess, the larger economy. And as a citizen, this is where it gets really fun. Uh, you know, I want honest, responsive government that isn't beholden to, beholden to special interests, as if we're not all a special interest. Uh, I, mean, you know, I want to pay a fair price for goods and services. I want a good wage. I want an opportunity to move up the ladder. And the bottom line is, I pay my taxes. I expect to recognize all the benefits to which I feel I'm entitled. However, I also believe that everyone should have a safe, decent place to live, but not here. <laughs> this isn't a good place because we've got too many, you know, too many affordable housing uh, in our neighborhood. It needs to be over there. Um, I don't want it if um, if I can if, if those folks can see over my fence. Uh, not if they might park, mark, park, might park in front of my house. Not if they might drive by the school because that's unsafe. Um, not, if you can, not unless you can guarantee my property value will never go down. We hear a lot of that. Uh, you know, not if it's going to, not if it's going to attract other people to the community that can't afford to live here. 
if you must. It can't look like poor people live there. And, it, and again, like I said, it, it, we, we hear this in, in, in public comments where, you know, people make outrageous requirements. And so I think that, you know, part of the uh, issue is, is that we're creating a lot of problems for ourselves. So I'm not going to belabor this too much, uh, but you know, let's just talk about you know what's the role of the public sector in all this, and, and again, uh, I'll try to wrap it uh, back around to what we do and how we can help uh, address this, and what, uh, as a collectively as you as a group, can help uh, try to uh, narrow in, uh, narrow your focus in on what you need, what steps you need to take. So the first thing I'll say is that uh, you know in the public sector. Uh, you know, it, it, we need to, to look at, at allowing the more predictable, uh, or excuse me, uh, zoning should be predictable, but it, it, it can't be set in concrete. You need to have some flexibility in that. But I also will say that even though you have a little bit of flexibility, it's also important to stick to your guns so that, again, if you as a community have decided that we need this type of housing in our community, you can't be, um, I guess, bullied into uh, to, to not allowing a project to move forward because people were very vocal at the public hearing and said, uh-uh, not here, not now. Uh, you know, we hear the NIMBY, we hear the, the, the other acronyms, you know, not here, but not over there either, you know, the, that kind of stuff. You have to have, you have to have the, the greater good of the community in mind. Uh, we need to foster creativity and innovation. And, and here, kudos to Celaya, because, uh, again, approving a project with tiny houses, I think, was uh, remarkable because you don't see that uh, very often. So that's, a, that's an example of stepping outside the comfort zone. And I think that it also, the, the public sector needs to foster and invest in housing. And I say invest in housing, not, not develop housing. And uh, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm on fair ground here, uh, but we've seen examples where the public, has, the, the public sector has gotten has gone one step further and tried to create the housing itself and I'm not talking about housing authorities, I'm talking about the, the government itself trying to develop housing. And I think that that's, that's something that we want to be very cautious of. Uh, I can't point to any examples where that has turned out really well. Uh, but I can point to the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're writing the rules, interpreting the rules, and executing the rules, you really shouldn't be the one playing the game. Because that just creates a whole other set of unintended consequences. Uh, and it also requires a level of risk that, that isn't appropriate for the public sector. So we have to we have to engage the private sector, and I think that uh, again uh, I'm speaking uh, preaching to the choir here. With you know businesses have to recognize that you know it is part of their responsibility uh, this whole issue of, of, of affordable housing uh, because uh, we we all need a, a workforce that can, can live here. So you know it's promoting supportive public po policy, it's engaging partnerships with the public and nonprofit sectors. There's also a thing called employer-assisted housing, and this isn't just for ski resorts anymore. We actually have a, a program where we help uh, people develop these things around the state, both public and private sector uh, employers, where they recognize that they are having difficulty attracting and retaining. And you can do this in a couple of ways. You can uh, actually build or invest in affordable housing, you know, build an apartment building and have your employees live there. You can provide them a housing, uh, uh, a housing allowance, which is just wage in a different name, um, or you can provide down payment assistance or partner to, again, invest in housing that's going to be appropriate for your workforce, which has a spill-off effect to, uh, to the rest of the community. The other cautionary to uh, note here, and this is where I might find myself um, being run out of here, but be careful about the role of nonprofits because uh, nonprofits do have a triple bottom line impact to the community. And again, I'm, I represent one, so um, I, I think I'm pointing the finger at me here. But they have a triple bottom line impact to the community. We pay fewer taxes. Uh, our camp contributions to our organizations are tax deductible. And the programs we run are largely funded by the very taxes that we're not contributing to. That's a heavy, that's a heavy burden, brother. I mean, you know, if we're... If we're we're using the resources that we're not contributing to. We better do a darn good job uh, doing what we do. And so one of the roles I think that's really important is, and it, again, as you're, you're going down this path with the, uh, the multi-jurisdictional housing authority, keep this in mind that 
it's really important to assess existing resources before you start creating more and more entities because what that does is it dilutes the impact of everybody in that space. Because, you know, and again, instead of having one or and maybe I'll use this as an example. Uh, anybody participate in the Colorado Gives Day the other day? Uh, on Tuesday it was? And so, how easy was it for you to find the one nonprofit that, that you really liked? I mean, it was daunting. I mean, I pulled up just Larimer County to find a couple of the organizations I like supporting. There was 25 organizations that deal with pets. I mean, therapy animals and spray and neutering and, you know, the list went on and on and on. I was astounded. How many pets do we have? How many organizations do we need serving pets? Well, so my point here is, is that assess the resources that are out there before you start creating others. And I hope I'm not, you know, uh, just stepping on any toes here or anything, but keep in mind you already have a multi-jurisdictional authority here with a housing department, the COF. Upper Arkansas, the Upper Arkansas Area Council of Governments has a housing department. So instead of you know, taking the three to five years that it'll probably take you to you know, get a, a multi-jurisdictional authority up, stood up and running before it actually is producing housing units, you know, maybe as an interim step, you're trying to uh, increase the resources that are available and, and the emphasis that the COG has with their housing department. You know, just as a way to really get things moving quicker. So it's not gonna take you quite as long. You don't have to burn as much political capital. Um, I think, that, again, this is, I think, this is universally accepted, but you know, embracing the partnerships, and I mean that in a, in a true sense, is that there are going to be elements of addressing this problem that are best served by, by the private sector. You know, so that not, not just the developers and the builders, but the employers, the banks, everybody else, it really needs to be part of this, and it needs to be driven by a coalition. Because one thing I will say about the private sector is it, it, it instills a sense of discipline that isn't necessarily present in the nonprofit sector. And again, I'm speaking uh, for firsthand here. Uh, funding partners, was an organization started in 90. Mile High Community Loan Fund was an organization started just a year or two later in Denver. We were both serving the state of Colorado. We had a few <coughs> products that they didn't have, and they had a few products we did. And over the course of time, we realized that we were, we were battling each other and we were diluting the impact that either one of us had. So we actually murdered, we, we got married this year. So, you know, I'm a new guy, thank you. Uh, but no, so we, we recognized that we, we were culpable uh, for, for some of the problems. We were diluting the impact that either one of us had individually. We got together and now we can do far more. We actually have grown our resources since May when we uh, made it official. We've actually grown our, our collective resources by another 15%. And next year we're projecting a 22% increase, uh, and that's simply because of the uh, you know the excitement that could build around uh, you know a strong, bigger, stronger organization. So I don't want to belabor that point, but do keep this in mind: nonprofit is a section of the IRS tax code. It's not a mission statement. A nonprofit, when you create a nonprofit, you really need to spend a lot of time developing a very viable, durable business plan. And that includes identifying where your funding streams are. Because again, we know that public subsidy is, as a, as a uh, portion of the uh, total population is going down. We have fewer resources to address a bigger, bigger, bigger need. And so be cognizant of that. that it, it isn't just a nonprofit, it's an organization that doesn't pay income tax. You need to generate revenue, so make sure that you're building a business model that generates the revenue that you need to support the organization. That's how you start to make it, uh, an impact. And so I'll wrap it up with this, that you guys have made some great strides. Uh, I think the, uh, the housing study has done a tremendous job of identifying some of the needs. I don't think that, uh, again, it's the end all. You need to take it and run with it uh, to create uh, greater impacts, and I was really pleased to hear the panel up here that was talking about all the other components of your community that actually <coughs> depend on safe, decent, basic housing. Uh, you know, again, just four walls and a roof. Let's start with that, and then let's build from there based on what uh, different segments of your community need. Um, so, with that, maybe I'll stop and just see what element of uh, my presentation is going to cause you to uh, flatten my tires or, uh, you know, have
had to run out of here. But no, I, seriously, I, I, I welcome the opportunity to um, be with you this afternoon, and I will be here this afternoon, uh, and, and, and working in the working groups, uh, to, to really start talking about key elements to moving this whole program forward. Uh, so I'll just stop with that and find out if there's any questions, comments that folks have. Mr. Pryor. Take a lot first. Okay, <laughs> great. Commissioner Todd pointed out that we have some projects in the private, se private sector kind of coming on to present um, some price point variations in housing. What is very just nascent, just beginning, and has a very tenuous commitment is um, financial and even philosophical commitment to an entity to support those potentially accessible uh, properties to stay that way. We don't have an active entity to do that when we are starting with one. But I think we need to have a, a real commitment to that entity and funding source for it and to touch on that. But you know, here my fear I guess is these properties will come online and then there's a mass scramble for them and there's nothing in place in fact. Security. Keep those there. Excellent point. Excellent point. And I would point to the fact that, and it was, uh, I think it was brought up, uh, Reed may have been the one that, that pointed out that there's a Colorado Community Land Trust that was started at Lowry in Denver, but they changed their name to Colorado Community Land Trust. They already have infrastructure. And so what they can do is really provide some of that uh, back office functionality, uh, some scale, some efficiencies that a, 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 a what we in the banking industry, I'm, I'm a recovering banker, by the way. Uh, we call it de novo. Uh, you know, so it just, it, from scratch, it doesn't have a, whole, um, a lot of the systems in place that allow you to manage those deed restrictions. Uh, with the efficiency and I think the predictability that the, the market is going to demand. And so there are partners that may not be located in Chafee County, but they exist within the state that can provide that functionality because you're absolutely right. If you, if you put housing in the market that has deed restrictions or it's under a land trust and you don't have a, a credible, viable uh, business plan for the entity that's going to manage those restrictions ad infinitum, then you're going to have a very, very unsuccessful program and you're going to have a lot of people that have ticked up that they were promised one thing and they got something very different. And, it, and, and the, the, really the rubber hits the road when we have a bump like in 2008 through, well, I'm sorry, up here, uh, you guys didn't get the word there was a recession until about 2010. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, something like that comes up and that's when it really gets tricky and you need to have a strong organization that knows how to deal with those kinds of situations. And so when you see the, that coming about, who's initiating that? Is it the county commissioners, is it the city councils, is it the private builders that are saying, I need this help with this deep restricting process? I mean, we've got to... Everybody. Everybody. I know that's a, it's an easy answer. But it, it could come from it could come from the uh, the public sector. It could be the commissioners contacting. But you know, I mean, you've got some great champions in the room here, and there isn't any one of you that can't pick up the phone and call Jane Harrington. I mean, you, I think you mentioned that you spoke to her at the uh, at the conference. Any way you pick up the phone and call her, say Jane, can you come up and help us figure this out? How do we set up this organization? And if you need contact, that's a, I think that's one thing that I do bring to the table. I mean, the good looks isn't the only thing. Uh, but you know, got a great contact list. In fact, it's a Rolodex, um, believe it or not. Um, but at any rate, yeah, I think that you do need to reach out. And again, I, I, I will put myself out there as a resource so that if there are elements that you're not really sure about, what do we, you know, who, who do we need to have at the table so that we can assess all these resources that exist? We don't have to uh, re reinvent the wheel. I'm a big champion of that. Yes, sir. Joe, I learned of you from Autumn, who <coughs> said you were looking for projects in rural areas that you can step in and support. Can you describe for us in a generic way what kinds of things you might be interested in pursuing with us? And, and also, Lake County is in the room. I think we've got uh, Eagle and Summit. But just in general, where do you think you can have the most impact in this region? 
Okay, well, so uh, I'll go back to uh, one of the things that we uh, have done is create both the uh, uh, re what we call retail financing that goes directly to uh, homeowners, but in terms of the uh, kind of the larger picture, and it sounds like uh, there's some uh, uh, energy around the room in creating rental opportunities. Uh, so what we do is we can come in not only provide technical assistance to help you design a project, you know, and, and, and be and again, my mother told me this. She said the devil never had such strong counsel in his life. Uh, I can be the devil's advocate to poke holes in what you're what you're thinking you want to do, just to kind of strengthen and make you think about all the elements that are going to be necessary to make a successful program. Uh, the next step is we actually provide financing, so we can provide that early stage financing to acquire the dirt. Uh, to get through the entitlement process, to do architectural engineering, all that fun stuff. Uh, and we provide construction financing. And then, well, the only thing we don't do is that, that permanent mortgage that, that resides on the property. You know, that's where we, go to, that's where we want to partner with our banks uh, that, that are providing us the capitalists. We want to hand that out because that's something that they do rather well. What we can do, though, is provide some subordinated debt that maybe sits behind them. So, you know, we can take a project from that nascent thought to all the way through the process. And, uh, and again, you know, we've done projects not only here in, uh, in well, I, I shouldn't say in, in Shady County, in Fremont County, we've had uh, uh, projects in Lake County, in Summit, in Eagle County. So, you know, we, we've surrounded you, so it's about darn time we do something here, right? Um, and and uh, get, uh, I'm sorry my friends at the collegiate banks left, but, you know, I was going to promise to use their money to help you. <laughs> Did that answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Everybody ready for a nap? I can't resist. As a, as a career marketing person who did major packaging of products, mm -hmm. um, you made a, a point earlier about you know if it's basic, uh, you don't need to be putting the bells and whistles on people that are trying to get into the housing market. And maybe the housing shouldn't look the same. And as a individual who spent more two over two decades packaging products um, and having built uh, 19 by 68 rectangles in Lake County, putting a different roof pitch that doesn't cost it almost anything, or putting a little gingerbread there's a fine line between what I'm going to call the Section 8 look and housing that is very basic but fits within the community. And just to put that out there that a paint color doesn't cost any different than a different paint color, maybe $100 on gingerbread to spice up a basic house, if you can kind of temper the, the basic, don't put any bells and whistles, don't put the expensive brick or the copper finishing, but don't make these people that are struggling to get into the housing market suffer from looking like Section 8 housing. And, and it's a packaging issue. If you can temper it, I think you can win on both sides. Fair enough, fair enough. And, I, and, I, and I'll be the first one to tell you that I'm not a big fan of tough sheds for housing. Right? Um, maybe I come across that way, but you know, you at least put curtains on it, I guess. <laughs> but your, your point's well taken that there are some things that you can do, some elements that don't necessarily add to cost that can create something that is, uh, you know, uh, get more attractive, not only to the community, but to, you, you do want to instill a sense of pride. I mean, so folks do have, uh, you know, do have, want to have pride in the place they live. So you don't want to create just concrete boxes. But at the same time, we don't need to, to uh, go overboard. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, sir. I've got one for you. Can zoning change the price of infrastructure? I think it influences. I don't know how much it can change it. But it, it certainly influences it. So when you talk about infrastructure, I'm thinking in terms of you know running uh, water mains, uh, uh, curb cuts, um, you know accessibility and so forth. I think that absolutely zoning does influence those things. 
I think that it's, it's important to keep in mind that I'm not suggesting that we go back to the uh, 1840s. That it's, you know, land rush, put whatever you want up wherever you want it. Uh, I mean, we do have to have some standards. I bring these points up because I think it's important to keep in mind that every time you update your building code, there are costs associated with it. But the building code, when they, when they issue those, they don't do a, an economic analysis. Right? What they're doing is they're saying, here's what we believe the best practices are. But it isn't necessarily saying you actually are gaining uh, some efficiencies and some, uh, some other benefits to the community by ins instituting these. And uh, you know, one thing I point out is uh, uh, fire sprinklers. You know, so that's the new, that's a new thing in the, in the business codes. They want fire sprinklers in every home. And that, you, know, you can make the argument that, well, it's you know, four to $6,000 a unit. And maybe this is going way past your question, but uh, you know, four to six thousand dollars. So it saves one life. It's worth it. But what you're not thinking of is it's four to six thousand for every unit that gets built. And so now we're talking. And again, I'm not trying to put a price tag on life here. What I'm saying is, is it's adding millions of dollars across a community in costs. But we have other elements within our business, or excuse me, within our building codes and. and uh, uh, requirements that allow fire uh, trucks to get in there and you have fire stations every so often. You know, what we don't see a lot of because of building codes is a lot of house fires that cause, you know, severe injury and death. I mean, they do occur, but the occurrence has gone way down. And so, what is the incremental value of sprinkling every system? And that's a question that needs to be asked. And so, again, going back, maybe getting back to your question is, uh, you know, when you look at how wide the streets need to be and, and what size of pipe needs to, to run to that house. I mean, let's think about what's overkill. You know, what's going above and beyond what's really necessary. And especially now that we're seeing a lot of new technology that's coming out there, uh, you know, you have smaller uh, self-driving cars, which I fear. Um, but, you know, do we still need to have the same kind of parking requirements that, that we do now? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, so it may serve the need now, but you know, 10 years down the road, are we gonna have a, a bunch of vacant parking? Maybe that's, maybe that's one way of doing land banking, I don't know. But we need to have that conversation. Is that? Yeah, it, was just, it, it seems like there's been a lot of requirements. Well, instead of an eight inch water line, maybe we can do a six. Or maybe we can do it out of plastic instead of clay or steel or whatever so there's a lot of demand for zoning to reduce the standards that are needed yeah and i think that it, it's important that when you when you engage that conversation and actually that's that's not one that we hear a lot where we're you know backing off of zoning requirements but i think it's important to have that conversation about okay what can we where, where are we over over prescribing and where do we have some flexibility that doesn't that isn't going to imperil you know, life and safety of, of you know, the inhabitant of the home. That's the last thing we work with. Well, great. I guess it's nap time, right? Is that where we're at? I thought I saw that in the agenda. Great to have someone come up here and share alternate opinions. And uh, I think we've got a good, had a good diversity of discussion this morning. And I hope you guys all appreciate um, what we've been able to talk about. Um, next, we're going to have Eileen Rogers come up here, and she's going to direct the activity for this afternoon and our breakout session. I lost 35 years of teaching and I've lost my voice. 
Um, I want to remind those of you who have done part of this for a long time, and those of you who haven't, about a few people who have been instrumental in making this year's Action of the Housing uh, uh, Group. And that includes Randy, that includes Bob Christensen, that includes Sarah McDonald, that includes Joel. I remember Joel at one of the IGA meetings early this year challenging the rest of the government officials into saying, do we want to do this? If we do, let's do it now. And we went after it. And I want to thank you, Joel, for doing that. Um, particularly, that was the reason that the study would happen. And I really believe that's the reason why we're here today. Now, before we get started, let me uh, remind you that this is really something you get involved in now. You've been sitting in lecture to, and that's what a good teacher does in the afternoon, that the kids act in the room that you act in. We want you to move to the tables that uh, rep represent them, uh, groups of um, HVAC people. And uh, let me make sure I have the groups. Um, let's start with uh, uh, Paige Judd. Where are you? Okay, I think I got the Outreach and Education. Okay. Um, Lawton, over here, and she's in uh, pub Public Private Partnerships, the Triple Bs. Um, Kimberly. We're going to be over there. Okay, you're going to be over there. And she's with Family and Youth Initiatives, the first 50. Uh, Wendell is back here, and he'll be talking from the Economic Development Corporation. And finally, Reed, who will talk about uh, Colorado uh, Housing Trust. Now, we will work until 3 o'clock, and then we will get back together and share your ideas. We want you to set goals. We want to have all of us doing things in 2017, not just talking about them. Do you have something, Pat? Um, sorry, guys. I'll be uh, doing the policy, land use, and zoning group over here. That's Did I mention it? <laughs> and not the housing trust. Um, are there any other topics that people feel are pertinent or are there other groups that want to get together and discuss their own thing? If so, feel free to take over any of the extra tables. Um, this is a time to network, this is a time to brainstorm, and at the end of the session, we're going to present the findings or the plans we've come up with for 2017. So it's very much about getting to work, but it can be very free-forming, so don't feel that you have to be constrained to the existing boxes. Be happy and share your ideas. Thank you. I know. No, I'm just going to also add that we've got Sarah Blanchard here from the Vista Housing. Ah. We're going to talk about what they do. And I know we've got Lake County and Summit County and uh, Neal County folks. You can be your own table or you can sit with us and ask us questions and, and learn from us. So it's kind of wide open. We just mm -hmm. want you to have some outcomes and plans for 2017. So Sarah, you're going to park here to be your table? OK, great. So anybody who wants to talk to Sarah, great resource. Fortune to have her here. And we also um, have Christy Dog from Dolo. Uh, so um, maybe you join uh, Sarah. So there you have it, folks. Thank you.